So we're going to start out our discussion by focusing on something called the Flight Listing App, or FLAP, case study. And we'll be using this case study to demonstrate a whole bunch of things throughout this semester. We're going to talk about object-oriented programming in the context of this case study. We're going to talk about functional programming in the context of this case study. Hopefully, you're familiar with that from other courses you've taken as part of this program. And then we're also, the main real, the real main focus of this is to cover something called reactive streams, which is a newer, cooler paradigm that builds upon and extends object-oriented and functional programming in very interesting ways. And we'll cover that in great detail. The particular case study we're going to focus on can be used to list airplane flights via various apps that are connected over the web. So we're going to have, for example, you could connect to this through a browser. You could connect this through an Android phone. We actually have a nice Android client that we've worked on that's really cool. That kind of looks like the, the Southwest Airlines flight listing and booking app. And we're going to use this as a running example throughout the course to illustrate a lot of really, really interesting things. So let's start out by talking about what FLAP is. So the, the flight listing app showcases Java concurrency and parallelism frameworks, which are some things we've talked about in other courses in the master's program, plus a bunch of new cool stuff, to demonstrate the use of both synchronous and asynchronous communication and processing in the context of various spring-based platforms in order to, to list airplane flights. At some point, we're going to get more ambitious and actually make a flight booking app where you can book flights, but that requires uh, a lot more work than we had time for for our demonstration. So we're just doing a flight listing app. But even that is super cool and shows up all kinds of interesting things, as we'll talk about in a second. The first version of this app, which we're going to start talking about tonight, and then we'll probably elaborate on in more detail over the next couple of weeks, uses a so-called monolithic client-server architecture that's implemented using <laughs> called Spring MVC, where MVC stands for Model View Controller. You're probably familiar with that acronym. And this is something that's part of the Spring Boot, Spring Boot framework. And this particular app is used to sequentially list airline flights using objects or components that interact within one process. So it's a fairly simple app, but it's really cool. And it lays the groundwork for much more interesting, much more powerful apps that we'll talk about later. And even this relatively simple app will demonstrate a lot of very interesting concepts in the context of dependency injection and automated persistence and connecting uh, Android clients written with some cool techniques with various web uh, based web MVC based spring application components and services. And you can get access to the code that I'm referring to here at the link down below. So if you go to that page, you should be able to get access to it. If you have any problems, of course, please don't hesitate to let me know. So what is Spring Boot? So Spring Boot is a very popular framework for creating web apps using something called convention over configuration, which is a design paradigm we'll talk about in just a second. So the architecture of Web MVC or Spring Boot that we're talking about at the moment We'll have a client, which could, again, be a, a browser, could be a mobile app written for iOS or Android or whatnot. And the client will send HTTP requests from the client device over to something called a controller. And the controller typically resides in a server, although for testing purposes, they don't have to be on different machines. But in production environments, they would run in a different computer. And the controller basically acts as the mediator between the HTTP requests that come in from the client and the rest of the application, which looks pretty much like good old Java objects in many ways. And you'll see that based on the principles of dependency injection, we're able to wire together various components to make a monolithic application. And this is done by implementing services. And you'll see what a service is. And services are, are pretty cool. They're very much like good old objects, but they have certain nice properties that make them easier to work with when you use dependency injection. And I'll talk more about what dependency injection is as well. 
One of the other nice things we do with this approach is we have persistence built into our application or, or Spring, Spring Boot, Spring MVC can make objects fairly trivially persistent by using something called JPA, which is the Java Persistence Architecture. And this is super cool. Uh, you'll see it's, it's relatively easy to program for the kinds of things we're doing here. And that'll make it really easy to persist some of the entities that we want to be able to access in our Flap application. So what does it mean to be convention over configuration? This is a really weird term. Uh, I've, I've never really been able to understand exactly why they use that term. But if you look at the link at the bottom of the slide, you'll see more about it. But it's basically a design pattern. It's really sort of an architectural pattern used by software frameworks like Spring MVC to decrease the number of decisions that app developers using the frameworks must make without losing flexibility. So the idea is to provide essentially a blueprint that can be described in certain ways. This blueprint has reasonable defaults, so you get working stuff pretty much out of the box. You only have to specify the things that, that vary, so it's kind of a commonality variability approach and you're focusing on the variabilities, the application-specific stuff. It, can greatly reduce the number of decisions you have to make because a lot of things are done by convention. And uh, as we'll see, there's a healthy dose of aspect-oriented programming that underlies this whole paradigm. And in many ways, if it's done correctly, and that's the tricky part, you can eliminate a lot of distractions because you don't have to worry about low-level niggling details, things like how do you implement a, a database, a relational database? How do you convert HTTP requests containing JSON encoded values into parameters passed to methods and many, many other kind of lower level aspects of developing client server web-based applications that you otherwise would have to write by hand. So it takes care of a lot of that stuff. And uh, this concept of a blueprint is very important. Later versions of Flap, which we'll cover once we get past the first you know, five or six weeks in this course, we'll start applying more interesting capabilities. So the, the first thing we're going to do is this monolithic approach that's sequential, fairly simple. But then we're going to kind of pump it up on some steroids and give really cool object-oriented capabilities that will be both concurrent and parallel, functional capabilities that can be concurrent and parallel. And then the creme de la creme, which is really the focus of this course, reactive capabilities or active streams capabilities that are concurrent and parallel. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take our monolithic architecture and decompose it or spli uh, slice it up into a microservices architecture using a couple of techniques. We'll, we'll do a microservices implementation that uses kind of conventional Spring MVC style programming. But then the kind of um, end all be all of this course will be a version of microservices based on the reactive web flux platform, which is super duper duper cool and allows you to be able to do almost completely asynchronous processing and communication between client and many microservices. And what's cool about this is these microservices in a production environment can actually run in multiple processes across a cluster of computing nodes, thereby being able to scale the system up and out so that you have much greater ability to handle a larger load. So we will talk extensively about these different techniques and these different approaches. And you can find the code for these things in these other repositories. The, the code is still under construction, so it will change quite a bit before we get to it, but just know where it's going to be by looking at these slides. So what is WebFlux? Well, WebFlux is a reactive web app framework that's fully non-blocking, which means that you never block unless you really, really have to. And it also supports so-called back pressure across network connections using various classes from the Project Reactor framework, in particular classes called Mono and Flux. And uh, we're going to learn a lot about Monos and Fluxes by the time the class is done. This diagram here kind of shows the relationship between Spring MVC, which is what we're going to focus on first, and Spring Web Flux, which is what we're going to focus on next. 
And some things are shared. You can have these things called controllers. We'll talk about them, which are kind of these mediators between the world of HTTP and JSON and the world of Java and Java type system. There's also reactive clients that you can have in both. But with Spring WebFlux, you can have functional and reactive endpoints. You can have this cool concurrency model and a completely non-blocking underlying communication engine based on the NETI framework. With Spring MVC, in contrast, you, you typically write more code imperatively. That's one of the big differences between in, uh, reactive or functional programming, which is declarative, versus object-oriented programming, which is more imperative. And uh, there's also some other things we're going to talk about, which I'll get to in a second, that go above and beyond what you get with classic Spring MVC. The first version of the app we're going to look at, the first version of Flap, which we're going to start looking at tonight, uses synchronous two-way calls and good old-fashioned object-oriented programming features. And there's a little, little splash of Java sequential streams thrown in just because it's too painful to write certain code in purely object-oriented ways. But this is not meant to be uh, a scalable production system. It's just meant to get the points across to illustrate you know, running examples and things that we're talking about in the other videos from the other part of the course. And in particular, if you take a look at this diagram here, you can see that in a monolithic app, you've got a bunch of service components, which are implementations of services, and these all run in the same address space. And that's designated here by this kind of gray round angle called monolithic app, which is a single process with a bunch of components in it. There'll be an object-oriented version of Flap that uses synchronous two-way calls and various Java concurrency frameworks, some of which uh, a number of you have taken in other versions of courses that you've taken from me because I've taught courses like the Concurrent Object-Oriented Programming course. And in that course, we learned about things like Java threads, the Java executor framework, and uh, we probably won't go through that stuff in great detail. I'll provide pointers to the information that you can watch if you want to learn what those things are, but just giving you kind of a uh, the next level up from just a, a very simple monolithic version of an application that has no concurrency in it to a fairly straightforward object-oriented implementation that uses classic Spring MVC synchronous two-way calls, but uses microservices. So we're going to have a bunch of different microservices that are running around that could actually be mapped to different computers or different processes on the same computer or whatever you want to do. And that allows the system to scale up and scale out more effectively. The next version we're going to look at is a functional implementation of Flap that's going to use synchronous and asynchronous two-way calls based on some of Java's functional parallel and async programming frameworks, in particular, Java Parallel Streams and Java Completable Futures. So these are also things I've taught in other courses in, in this sequence, in this program. If you haven't taken those courses, don't worry. I'll provide links to the videos you can watch if you want to learn what we cover. Um, and again, th this is just to demonstrate the fact that you can use functional programming to make your systems more effective and more responsive and more scalable by using various functional parallelism and concurrency frameworks that Java provides. But where we're really going and where we're going to spend the bulk of the time, especially the, the last two thirds of the course, is going to be an implementation of Flap that uses async two-way calls and various Java reactive streams frameworks, including Project Reactor and Rx Java. And this is just absolutely the bee's knees, because one of the things you'll see here is that using WebFlux and the Project Reactor mechanisms in conjunction with an Android client that uses Rx Java, we can get a completely asynchronous communication model and computation model that is just so scalable and so declarative and so convenient once you understand how to read reactive streams-based code. It's kind of like functional programming if you're familiar with Java parallel streams or Java completed futures, but it has a little bit more of a uh, kind of a pub sub-like flavor to it. And we'll, we'll talk all about that when we get a little further along. This flat case study will also show off a bunch of other really cool things. These will not necessarily be the key focus of the course, but we will cover them for sure. So we'll talk about advanced graphic user interfaces, 
with our, our, our Android GUI that's really super duper cool. We'll show off a bunch of different persistence models. We'll use the kind of the classic JPA, Java Persistence API, or Java Persistence architecture-like model. And that's kind of a two-way synchronous model. But then we're also going to show something called R2DBC, which is an asynchronous model, which is cool because it integrates seamlessly in with all these reactive streams mechanisms that we're using from Project Reactor and Webflux. So the entire application is asynchronous, which is really cool. And then there's also various tools. We'll talk about things like mocking frameworks, like mock K and other stuff for testing and, and other ways of trying to assure that the program is doing what we want. So that's the end of the overview of FLAP. And uh, again, you'll, you'll get lots of different views of how this works. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun because it's something you can play with. The applications you'll do for assignments will be consistent with the things we're talking about here. And I think you'll really enjoy seeing all these different paradigms compared in a apples to apples way. It's kind of like a Rosetta Stone. Once you understand how things work with a monolithic architecture, then as we move to the microservices approach, we'll look at object-oriented ways of doing it. We'll look at functional ways of doing it. We'll look at reactive ways of doing it. And each time the functionality will be the same, but the means by which it's accomplished will be different. And I think that'll make it easy to make that transition as you learn these different paradigms.